Hey friends, it's good to be back with you. And today I'd like us to take our last dive into calculating pi. Now before we go any farther, let's remind ourselves why we're doing this in the first place. I mean, we know what pi is. People have known what pi was for millennia now. The goal is not to calculate this number we already know. The goal is to learn how algorithms work. And perhaps you've noticed the pattern. There's some fundamental idea, some strategy or cal for a calculation that will get you to an estimate of pi, and it's always an estimate. The next step is to figure out how to code that, you know, how to boil that down into a uh, programmable set of instructions. And the third is to evaluate it. So we'll find out our estimate, and then some idea of how good that estimate is. And with the series, an idea of how good that estimate is comes from how small the successive terms are. If the su successive terms are very small, we must be getting closer to an answer. We have to be careful about that, but that's, that's, that's the basic idea. So we've, we've drawn circles. That was pretty intuitive. Trig functions, less intuitive, but not too hard to follow. Now we're to Machen-like formula. Now I could have thought about this for a long time, and I wouldn't have come up with this. So this is, to, to, for my way of thinking, this is a, a, a bit of an insight. Now John Machen was a contemporary of Newton, and he published his formula in 1706. So this is not new. It's been around for a long time. And when you think of how much hand calculation this involved, it's, it's pretty impressive. Now here's Machen's insight. And again, I hope I'm getting his name right. He's English, so it, probably Machen. Let's just take these two numbers. 3 plus i, and I'll call that c plus, no, oh, hang on. I'll just call that c for right now. All right, let's just go ahead and multiply this out without being too worried about where we're going yet. Okay, we've done this before. We know how to do this. If you work this out, this turns out to be 5 plus 5 i. All right. Well, that means C in polar form is the square root of 50, and the angle is pi over 4. Wait a minute. What just happened here? Look at that. We don't care about the magnitude. We care about that. Huh. Pi over 4. Well, seems like we're on to something here. Let's draw, let's see, I don't need this anymore. Let's draw out these numbers as triangles. Okay, with real being the horizontal and uh, imaginary being the vertical. This is 2, and that's 1. And I'll call that angle alpha. This one is 3 and 1, and I'll call that angle beta. It's not a very good beta. I guess that'll do. All right. So that means C is the square root of 5, because that's the magnitude here. And this one's the square root of 10 times the square root of 10 times alpha plus beta. Well, that means alpha plus beta is pi over 4. OK, we're getting close. How are we going to calculate alpha and beta? Well, let's see. Why we're going to do this, I might say something like alpha is inverse tangent of a half, and beta is the inverse tangent of a third. OK, I like where this is going. Well, remember that uh, equation we had, or the, the series we had for pi, where it was inverse tangent of 1, and it took forever to converge? One of the things I mentioned was if the argument were less than 1, the series would converge faster. Remember that the inverse tangent of x is x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the fifth over 5 minus x seventh to the seventh. Da, da, da. Okay. The argument x, if that argument was less than 1, these terms would get small pretty quickly. Oh, look, they do. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say pi is 4 times inverse tangent of a half plus inverse tangent of 
a third. Write those out as Maclaurin series here, and you've got an algorithm for calculating pi that has all the features we want. It's going to give you the right answer. It's going to boil down to addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, because that's all you get to do with a digital computer. And it's going to converge quickly, because these terms are going to get small pretty fast. Now, convergence is controlled by the largest of these two numbers. Well, the largest is a half. This, one, this, this term here is going to converge much more slowly than the second term. Well, what does this term look like? Well, let's see. Inverse tangent of a half is going to be a half minus one third times one half to the third power. So it's getting small pretty quickly. One fifth, one half to the fifth power minus one over seven, one half to the seven. I'll get out of your way. There we go. So that's what that looks like. These numbers are going to get small pretty quickly. If you write these out, this is a half, sorry, not a third. Okay. I, I fixed that. So that's one half um, minus one over 24. Okay. You know, let's see. I'm looking at my computer over here to make sure I get the right answer. Plus one over 160. That's only three terms, and that term is already less than 0 0.01. So this, we're, we're looking good here. And this is one over 896. So there's uh, first power, third power, fifth power, seventh power. 1 over 896, this is almost 0 0.001. And the next one is going to be much bigger than that. This is really good news. This means that this term is going to get small really quick. This term is going to get small even quicker. So convergence is, is determined by whichever of these numbers is the largest. Okay, That's the largest number. So one last thing. This works. Are there others? Oh, you bet. There's many, many, many others. This isn't the, the equation or the formula that Machen originally published in 1706. Here's the one he published. Now remember, convergence is determined by the largest argument. So far, the largest argument we've seen is a half. Yeah, that's looking pretty good, huh? That's better than a half by, by a lot. I'm going to make sure I get this right here. These are really weird numbers. And it's 1 over 239. Holy smokes, look at that. That one goes to 0 almost immediately. This is the one that controls convergence, and that's much smaller. When you start taking this to powers, this gets small really fast. And during his lifetime, Machen calculated the first 100 digits of pi using this. Now, there are more Machen-like formulae, and I'll, I'll maybe mention those later. But this is, this is what kicked off a whole new generation of digit hunters, this, this approach here. Before we go to my computer, let's do one more thing. Let's, let's see if we can have a more general idea of where that one-half and one-third or where this came from. So clear out my board here. Let's take the real simple case here. A plus I b plus i, OK? And that has to equal c plus ci, because for theta to be for the, the final angle to be 45 degrees, or pi over 4, the real and imaginary term have to be 0. Well, let's just multiply this out and see what happens. So it looks like a, b plus i plus i, b plus i equals c plus ci. Hmm. That's starting to look like that's too many variables. Well, it's actually not. OK, so far, so good. Now let's collect the real and the imaginary terms here. So that looks like a, b minus 1 plus a plus yeah, b times i equals c plus ci. Still looks like too many. Uh, variables, and it kind of is, but not like you think. So, because these are complex numbers, you know that imaginary here, or I'm sorry, imaginary here has to equal imaginary there, real here has to equal real there. And the real and imaginary part are both equal to C. So, let's say AB minus 1 equals C. 
and it's A plus B. Well, if this and this are both equal to C, they've got to be equal to each other, aren't they? So AB minus 1 has to equal A plus B. Mm, okay, we're getting there. If I knew A, could I calculate B? Yes, let's try that. So let's see, B minus, or AB minus B equals A plus 1, right? All right, so that's, oops, hang on. B times A minus 1 equals A plus 1. And finally, did it again, B equals A plus 1 over A minus 1. Huh. What if A was 2? Let's see, 2 plus 1 over 1, B would be 3, which is what we got. Huh. Well, what we could do then is we could start guessing A's, and we could calculate B's, and we would try to get an A-B pair. So remember, for convergence, we're trying to find an A-B pair where the smallest of, the, of A and B is as large as it can be. Now, the way this works out, as A gets bigger, B gets smaller, so there's a limit. We're going to find a, a, a case where we can't make A and B converge any faster. Let's try something here. What if A was 2.5? Let's just, what, what would that be? And that's which is just 5 over 2. Okay. Well, what would B be? So let's see. 5 over 2 plus 2 over 2 plus 5 over 2 minus 2 over 2. All right, what would that, how do we get that turn out? Well, it looks like 7 over 2 divided by 3 over 2, or 7 over 3, which is 2 and a third. Now, let's pause for a moment here. One of the conditions that I haven't mentioned so far is A and B both have to be rational. They cannot be infinitely non-repeating like E or pi or something like that square root of 2, square root of 3. Those are infinitely non-repeating uh, numbers. So it's okay if it's infinitely repeating. This is 2.3333 on forever, but this is still a rational number. All right, so we're good to go here. If A is, is 2.5 and B comes out to be, uh, I'm going to put a B here, B comes out to be 2.333, the smallest denominator is still larger than 2. This ought to converge faster. All right? Well, with this in mind, let's get on my computer and let's go try it.